Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center educational webinar series. My name is Amna Anwar, and I'm the program coordinator for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. And with us, we have today Dr. Tariq Shaheen from Iris Telehealth, who will be presenting today's webinar, the topic for which is key ingredients for a successful telepsychiatry program. And in our panel, we also have Becky Sanders, who is the program director at the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. So without further delay, I will just hand it over to Dr. Tariq Shaheen. Excellent. Thank you, Amna. So I'll start by telling a little clinical story. So imagine we're in rural Indiana, late in the evening, 9 p.m. Um, into a rural emergency room walks a 27-year-old young lady. She's obviously in distress. Um, she has superficial cuts on her wrists. Um, and she's having fleeting thoughts of suicide. So this is a scenario that, that you know, we see fairly often. And you can just imagine sort of the, the frustrations that the um, ER staff have when they're having to manage this um, individual without any backup. Um, and then, of course, uh, imagine or feel the concern that this young lady has. And you know, she doesn't know what to expect and um, is, is coming into this organization to try and get help. Um, so this is a scenario we see very often. Um, and it's also a scenario that I think leaves us feeling uncomfortable because there is a person coming in for help and we are not necessarily able to fully meet that individual's needs. So I would then ask you to imagine that exact same scenario, um, same rural hospital or emergency room, same distressed young lady, um, same ER staff, except for in this scenario, they have access to a psychiatrist by consultation using telemedicine. And so in the same scenario, a psychiatrist is able to see this young lady within minutes, is able to understand her situation, uh, develop a treatment plan, work with the team to find really what would be the optimal care for this young lady. And that's really what the goal of telemedicine is, um, is, is delivering this level of access to people where and when they need it. And what we've seen time and time again is when we're able to do this, um, of course, access is improved. Costs um, are often in, uh, improved, uh, rather costs are saved. Um, and, and of course, most importantly, what we see is that this young lady can get the best treatment available to her. So I wanna to talk to you all a little bit today about telepsychiatry, um, about getting a program up and running. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about me. Um, I, I am a child psychiatrist. I founded Iris Telehealth really with the goal of trying to solve the problems that I was seeing in my training with really just disparate access to uh, rural and underserved communities. And that really became my passion to try and make an impact on these underserved communities. And telemedicine was um, really the avenue or the tool that I, I saw that I could use best to help meet that need. So what, what I'm hoping to do um, is, is give a very brief and hopefully fun and engaging conversation about getting a telemedicine program up and running. Um, you know, I don't know if, uh, if anyone of our participator, participators here are able to ask questions. I'm happy to answer them as we go along or at the end. Um, and really want to talk to you about what we've learned about creating a su successful program and um, some lessons that we've learned along the way. So we'll start by uh, going through the roadmap, which is just talking about how you get a, a program up and running. Next, we'll talk about the triple aim which is uh, improved access, decreased costs, and improved care. And finally, we'll wrap up with some lessons learned. So uh, without further ado, we will jump in. I don't want to cut you, Dr. Tarek. I just wanted to mention that you can ask questions at the end and type them in the chat box at the bottom. Excellent. Thank you. So you may be asking, why on earth uh, do we have a picture of an astronaut on the moon uh, when we're talking about telepsychiatry? So, I like analogies. I think that um, they're fun. They're, they're a useful learning tool. And so what we're going to use is the analogy of putting a man on the moon um, to relate to building a telepsychiatry program. And so I thought I was super clever. I had come up with this nice little analogy. And then I realized that um, it might be a terrible analogy because um, telepsychiatry is not actually that hard, right? It's not, it may not be the simplest thing to do, but it, it's certainly not rocket science. Um, so that being said, we're going to walk through a few steps, and we'll start by putting this in the frame of 
um, what we would need to do to put a man on the moon. And then of course we will use that as the analogy to discuss how we would get a telepsychiatry program up and running. So the first thing we need to do is set our destination. Um, this would be the goal or the problem we're looking to solve. For us, that's putting a man on the moon. Next is we need to develop the blueprints, which is a rough sketch of what we need to get there. You know, in this case, it's gonna be um, you know, a, a blueprint of a space shuttle and some of the steps required. Um, once we kind of have a plan, and um, a reasonable way of getting there, we need to get buy-in. Uh, and that's so getting the green light from everybody necessary to move forward with the project. Um, next, we have to put everything together. So that would be the execution phase of building the space shuttle, et cetera. Um, finally, we assemble um, the astronauts or the people who are gonna be manning um, the, the vehicle or, or doing the work. And then finally, we're able to blast off. So we'll, from there, begin um, using this analogy to describe building a telepsychiatry program. So if I'm gonna say two things that I want uh, everyone to take away from this meeting, the, this will be the first one. And that is the most important step in building a telepsychiatry program or really building any program or, or reaching a solution is clearly identifying the goals and what you want to accomplish. And that, that may seem very obvious, but I can tell you that a, a common mistake we see with groups is that they are not clear enough on what their goals are and what they're trying to accomplish when they start a telemedicine program or really any program. So this might sound painfully obvious, right? But if our goal is to get, you know, to put a man on the moon, the plan for doing that is going to be very different than if it's just our goal to, you know, walk across the street and uh, grab a bite to eat. So, right, the, the ends kind of dictate the means of what we're trying to do. Um, and this is really very important. We, we see lots of times groups will come at this and there's no consensus or clear idea on what individuals are wanting. And so even from day one, you can see that people are diverging in what they think and that can lead to some people kind of not working clearly um, as a team. So I'm gonna get my notes caught up here because I've gotta be on a separate unit. Okay. So, once we've identified our destination, the, the next piece that we need to do is to define the vehicle to get us there. And, um, you know, of course, if we're going to the moon, that's a space shuttle. And with a telepsychiatry program, that's going to be all of the equipment, the hardware and the software that we need to deliver the program. Um, I'm not going to get too in detail of the specifics, but at the end of the day, obviously, if you're looking to look for diabetic retinopathy, the equipment that you're gonna need is gonna vary if you're doing that as compared to just providing psychiatry services. So you've gotta understand what you need to accomplish and then you can work backwards from there. So this really brings up a, a, one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's my American architect, Lewis Sullivan. And the quote the quickly told is form follows function, but I'll, I'll read the full quote because I think um, it, is, it is telling of what really our goal is here. So I'm gonna look down at my notes. Um, it is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. This is the law. So I, I really like this quote for a lot of reasons. I, I think it, it talks in some ways to kind of the analytical or scientific side. Um, it can be applied just as easily in an in in emotional side. And I think what it really does is it kind of gets me feeling very curious. It kind of pulls me back to that, you know, childlike state where you just want to see how things fit together, if you can take them apart and, and put them back together. And so this is really, again, getting to what is our goal? And, and are we building a platform that allows us to accomplish that goal? So right, if we're trying to get to the, across the street, we're gonna do something very different than if we're trying to get to the moon. So, and, and the reason that, that I say that is that I've seen a lot of telemedicine programs get put together in a very, um, just duct tape kind of way. You grab one piece here and you grab another piece here and it's just strapped together without a logical sense of what they're trying to build. And, and that often shows in the final, um, product of, of what you're ultimately hoping to accomplish, which is a high quality telemedicine experience. Um, and we've also seen it, probably more commonly is people get excellent equipment. You know, there's a lot of vendors out there that will send, sell you very expensive uh, equipment that is high quality, but 
At the same time, you know, they have this fancy camera and it's mounted in the corner of the room. And, you know, we've gotten into these places, it's an expensive setup. And as a clinician, I'm just able to see kind of the, the top side of the, the kid's head, which is of course not a, a good clinical experience. So what we, you know, what we did in that situation is it took us five minutes, it took us a chair and a screwdriver and we were able to move that camera and really take that experience from, from a two to a 10 with really just understanding, you know, what are we trying to accomplish here? What tools do we need and how do we need to set it up to get there? Um, so as I said, I don't wanna to get too into the weeds in terms of what equipment you all need. I'm happy to field questions. What I will say just generally is that telemedicine equipment has gotten more accessible and more inexpensive. And I think a big reason for that is that we're seeing um, consumer grade equipment really pushing the field. So webcams, for example, with things like Skype and, and um, cell phones, you know, high quality webcam, microphone, all of those things are becoming very accessible as are secure video conferencing uh, technologies. So then once we have our plan, right, once we've developed what equipment and software we need, um, and we've got kind of a, a goal that we want to accomplish, a clinical goal that we want to accomplish, the next thing that we really need to do is to get buy-in um, from all of the decision makers. So this is from the clinical team. They need to be in agreement with what the clinical goals are. It needs to be from the financial folks agreeing that the finances make sense for the organization, that it's sustainable. It needs to be from um, you know, the, the visionaries in terms of does this fit with the vision of what our group is trying to do. Um, and so you've got to you know, have the money in place. You've got to have the support, et cetera. Um, and this is also very critical. Um, if there's not people who are wanting to see a program succeed early on, I think that you're very likely to see many bumps in the road and have a tough, you know, a tough path ahead of you. So really getting buy-in um, is important. And the way that we find that that is done best is by having a champion in the organization. So somebody who truly believes in what they're trying to accomplish and is able to, you know, sell that idea to the organization. So the next part's fairly um, simple, right? This is the get or done phase when you have a plan, you have a, a sense of how you're gonna get there, you have buy-in, you have the resources. This is when teams start talking together. So IT um, acquires the equipment and sets it up. The clinical team does the scheduling and, and is looking for the clinicians. Um, leadership is finding about how they're gonna integrate this within their system. So this is sort of where people roll up their sleeves and, and get the work done. And again, referencing back to the first point, this step is pretty easy if you have a good plan. If everybody agrees on what the goals are and how you're gonna accomplish it, this is usually um, a stage where things are able to move smoothly. All right, so this is probably the second most important step beyond defining what your goals are. And this is assembling the clinical team. So at the end of the day, uh, the delivery of healthcare is still very much a, a human interaction of physician and patient or clinician and patient. And so no matter how good your equipment is, no matter how good your plan is, um, if the clinicians aren't um, committed to providing services via telemedicine and they're not good clinicians, you're not likely to have a successful program. So what, one issue that we often see in organizations is they will push telemedicine onto their clinicians and just force every clinician to do it in some sort of way. And often they don't have the training and they don't feel comfortable with it. And as a clinician, I mean, I can tell you, um, new technologies, especially if they're not intuitive, can be very frustrating for us. Um, so it's really important to get clinician buy-in, um, especially if you're an organization trying to do this internally. You know, in our case, it's a little different. I mean, clinicians... <laughs> Um, if a clinician wants to work with us, they very clearly want to do telemedicine. But if it's internal in a group, you've got to be mindful that not every single clinician might want to do this. And if you force them to do it, um, you might not have the same results that you're hoping to have. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, at the end of the day, it is the clinical care that you're giving that ultimately you're going to be um, judged on. And so the clinicians are probably the most important factor in uh, getting that right. So the final step, this is where all the glory is, right? Um, all of the hard work comes down to this go live um, or blast off day. And, you know, I think that uh, something we've all heard is first impressions count. And that, that is certainly true in the world of healthcare. Um, so you want to make sure the first day that you go live with patients, it's as smooth as possible. And there are a lot of ways to try and do that. I think the um, biggest advice that we have is doing dry runs. So to try and imitate a real live situation um, beforehand, have the clinicians in place, the clinical staff in place, run um, really a scenario as if there were patients there. 
um, it, it builds a lot of confidence and faith in people when things work fairly well the first day. And, and that's something we commonly heard um, when, when we go live is it's like, oh, that, that was actually easier than we thought. And you know, the reason it's easier than, than you thought is that there was a lot of hard work that came beforehand. Just like you know, when you see any professional performance, it, it looks easy when, it, when they do it, but that's because there's a lot of training and, and thought that goes into it. Okay. So I want to spend a few minutes um, on this slide um, because it is a sobering bit of reality. And I think it's another area where groups will go off course. So we do all this work. We come up mm -hmm. with a plan. We uh, get the technology. We get everybody's buy-in. We build it. We get the clinicians ready. We schedule patients and we go live. Um, but the truth is, is we're really not anywhere near meeting our goals. We haven't really even delivered clinical care yet. And so in, in the same analogy as a space shuttle, um, you've just left the ground, right? You're, you haven't put a man on the moon yet. You've just, you've just blasted off. And so it's very, very important to monitor a program once it goes live. And, and this is something that I can't emphasize enough. Meet regularly, talk about things, see where your trajectory is and see how you need to adjust it to get to where you need to be. Um, you know, I think if you don't do that, it's kind of like the, the analogy would be kind of just putting monkeys on the space shuttle and let them, and let them navigate it. You, you need to be sure that you're navigating this in a way that makes sense. And so what we do is for the first month, we meet weekly with the clinicians. We touch base and say, how is the technology doing? How is the workflow? How is the experience with the clinical staff similarly? And then we space that out over time. And, you know, a few lessons, I, a few lessons learned, I'll kind of get ahead of myself. Um, there will be problems, right? That's the nature of it. So there, there are two types of problems. There are problems that can be solved and there are often problems that can't be solved. So the problems that can be solved, you work on towards solving. And the problems that can't be solved, you discuss them and let everybody know that you, know, you, you have looked into this and it's something that you know, is inherent with what we're doing. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, so long as people are heard in that you're actively working on things that can be solved. And if there's an issue, like, you know, let's just say it's an EMR issue. I mean, we, we all understand that we've all been there. So long as people understand that you, you have heard their needs, they're okay with that. It, it's really people have a problem when you're not communicating, when they don't feel that there's anyone who is taking their input and, and valuing it at all. Um, right. Not talking about a problem does not make it go away. So that's, that's just a big piece of advice that I have. And the other point of this is to not settle for mediocrity. Um, and, and just one brief, uh, story before we move on to the next point. So, um, I trained in med school, uh, you know, my first day in med school was like 12 or 13 years ago at this point. And I just remember that first day, um, when, you know, you get into the class, there's 150 other kids, you know, you're all pretty smart because you're in med school. Um, but then you're listening to this doctor talk and you have no idea. You just have no idea whatsoever what they're saying. And you all look around and you realize that you have this shared notion that you don't know if you're going to make it. You don't know if you're smart enough to do this. Um, and so at the end of the first day, you know, I went back to my apartment and I was living with a couple of other med students. And we, we had this agreement that we, um, we were going to suck less every day. That was um, our battle cry. In medical school. So we wrote it on a sheet of paper, we put it above our desks, and we just told ourselves, you know, we're going to suck less every day. Whenever we don't know something, we're going to learn it. Um, and that's what really got us through medical school. And I tell you what, I mean, I still apply that principle today, um, even as a clinician, you know, you're, you're constantly learning. And I think that that, that attitude of we're going to always improve, we're, we're never going to stop improving, has really been, uh, I think, very valuable. Starting a business is well, um, there's always room for improvement. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll move now into a whole new category of what, what is the triple aim, and this is kind of a buzzword in medicine, um, you know, and it really makes sense. There, there are three main goals that we're looking at is improved access um, or, you know, uh, uh, making it easier for patients to get the care that they need, decreasing costs, right, and this is a huge problem with the healthcare system. We have to manage our budgets, and then, of course, the most important is seeing results from the healthcare that we're delivering, so improving outcomes. So I think that telemedicine can do that um, in, in many ways, and I'll, I'll focus specifically on mental health because it's the area that I know, but I think that the same type of um, principles can really be applied to um, any part of, of medicine. And I know that this is probably preaching to the choir, so I'll just be very brief with this. So in, in mental health, what's most obvious is the lack of services, that there is just many communities that go without, which leads to untreated mental illness, worsening of mental illness, and then ultimately um, 
more severe illness that requires um, more costly interventions that are also less effective. So that's, that's the problem primarily that we see in, in mental health care. And what telemedicine can do is partner with these rural areas, uh, partner with these facilities to allow clinicians that are in um, you know, larger cities to provide some of that expertise to these rural areas. So it can decrease the difference in specialty care between um, a more metropolitan area and a rural area. All right, so the final piece um, of the talk is on lessons learned. And I think that this is probably, hopefully the most helpful and, and really what I'm hoping to have um, the conversation really be about with questions, et cetera, because I know that you know, we've all had experiences in this and what we have learned. Um, so you know, uh, there's a few things that I've learned. So really as we've gone through this, we have learned the value of seeing eye to eye with our partners. And so medicine is about relationships just like everything else. And if you're gonna work with somebody, you've gotta make sure that you agree on some fundamental principles before you move forward. And so this is basic things, like what are you all agreeing on in terms of patient care? What do you all view as successes of the program? You've gotta make sure that everybody is agreeing on the same goals before you get started um, or else and everybody's aligned to really do the same things or else you might not have a, a really a successful program another issue that we've seen come up and, and this is really you know I, I don't think that it's anyone's fault but i think it's something that we've learned and we've avoided is that we try strongly to build sustainable programs and that generally comes down to money um, and the primary time where we see a program is not sustainable is when there's a grant that's funding a program and they're not thinking to the future in terms of, you know, well, what do we do in this grant money? And I shouldn't say they're not thinking towards the future, but because the grant money is there, it's not necessarily as much of a priority of being sure that your program is gonna be financially sustainable. And so I, I think that that's another area where we found it's very important to stay ahead of that because um, as soon as the, the grant money runs out, um, you've done a, a great service to these individuals in the community, but then that service is often not available because the, the finances weren't there and the whole idea of you know, no money, no mission comes into play. And the third and final uh, piece that, that we've really learned has been an incredibly important for this is, is that happy people make for a happy business. So, you know, it might sound very obvious, um, but, you know, I'm a clinician. I'm not at all a, a business person by training. So I've had to keep things very simple. Um, in terms of how I view the business and how I view our relationships. And so, you know, really came to the understanding that, that we have three primary customers. And I think that this can be applied pretty much um, to anyone, to a healthcare organization or whomever. So our customers are our partners, which are the groups that we provide service to. Um, our other customer is our doctor or our clinician. Um, they're very important. They have to be happy with what they're doing. And of course, at the end of the day, um, it is the patients that you're delivering care to. And so we work very hard to come up with kind of a secret sauce to make sure that we can make all three of those groups happy. And to, to just very briefly break down what that is, and it's, it's really very simple. There, there's no magic here, but I think it's, it's easier said than done at times, is the first is that you just want the schedule to make sense. And this is the most practical thing. You have to make sure that um, you're able to provide the amount of time that is required, that there is the logistics in place, there's the staff available to cover that, staff, that, that timing, that the schedule is something that works well with what the clinicians are wanting to do. So really it's just nuts and bolts types of things. The second piece, getting a little bit uh, more abstract, is you've gotta make sure that people are doing what they're passionate about. And that's kind of getting back earlier to not forcing telemedicine on people. Um, when we're looking to find a, a, a clinician, we want to find a clinician who is doing what they love. So that might be inpatient work, that might be outpatient work, that might be substance abuse, it might be trauma, it might be working with kids. We really do not want to push people to do things that they are not just excited to get out of bed in the morning for. And the final thing that we look for is kind of cultural fit or personality. And you know, I, I've, I've come to learn this more and more the more I've, I've seen different groups operate. Um, I used to have an idea of what you know a good doctor is, and, and that's really broadened 
in, incredibly since I've been doing this. Um, you know, there are some things that clearly we want all of our clinicians to have in terms of a, a level of professionalism and an amount of compassion and care and, you know, doing this for the right reasons. But beyond that, you know, I've really come to learn that it's much more about the clinical match in terms of the right clinician with the right group of patients with the right clinic than any sort of right archetype of a clinician. And so we're looking for prescribing patterns, whether they're more aggressive or conservative or middle of the road. We're looking for the way that they interact with patients. Is it more kind of Freudian and professional or is it more casual and friendly? We're, you know, we're looking at all these little things that ultimately come down to the human interactions that this clinician is going to have day in day out with the patients and with the staff. Um, and you know, as you hear these things, you don't hear me talking a lot about the technology. Right, because at the end of the day, telemedicine is medicine. Right, it's it's the same thing. We want to help patients. We want clinicians and patients to develop relationships. The the technology can really just get in the way when it doesn't work. Right, it, it really when it's going well, it should be transparent. It should be in the background. Um, so th those are really the kind of key takeaways that that I've had. Um, I'm going to look at my notes and make sure I didn't miss anything big before I turn it over to you all. Um, so really, again, just emphasizing that it comes down to people that, that telemedicine when it's done well, looks like medicine. Um, and, and again, getting to the, the beginning of make sure that you have, um, a vision and a goals before getting things, before getting things going. So again, I, I kept it to 30 minutes. I, I would much rather field questions and have a dialogue than just continuing on. Um, so I, I appreciate everybody's, uh, time and patience. Thank you so much. I, you know, I love all of your analogies. You've really uh, hit a lot of highlights that, that I really appreciate. Um, this is Becky Sanders. I'm the program director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. And uh, I'm lo looking at our Q&A here, I have to agree um, with our, our first question. Um, first of all, you are the man. So the question is... <laughs> Do you see that many clinicians who want to start a telemedicine program put the cart before the horse? They put the technology before the process and the problem of how the technology can help. I mean, that's a great question. And I would say that, yes, I think that is what happens. And I think that the reason that happens is that it is the part that they are least comfortable with. It is the part that they are most anxious about. And so that's what they want to talk about. And that's what they want to think about. And I think that it can be, um, it can put the blinders on people. And so I think that once, you know, and that's often why doing a demo with a group and giving them a sense of comfort with how it works, once the technology kind of piece they feel comfortable with, and I'm a big believer, I used to do magic in the past, and I feel that you know the best magic is magic that happens in a pe person's hand. So as soon as a group sees it live, they see the process, they realize that this is really not some quantum leap. This is, this is a very familiar process. Um, and, and this is something that's been done before, then I think they can then put things in perspective. But I, I agree with whomever asked the question. I think that that is, it is an unnecessary hurdle, I think, for a lot of groups. They're afraid to move forward because they're afraid of the technology. And that might have been more of a, a truth 10 years ago, but I think nowadays those problems are much more readily solved. And then um, the follow-up to that is, do you recommend going more with a, a software as a service model or more like a room system, a Cisco Polycom? That's a great question. So we are software agnostic um, uh, with Iris Telehealth. So we have this great opportunity to try like everything. And I do think that there are different applications for different processes. So. Of course, if you're a clinician and you are wanting to provide care to each of your patients' homes and you have, you know, 400 patients, a polycom, you know, group 500 unit is not a practical solution to you. So I would say that form follows function again here. I think that it is hard to argue with a cloud-based software as a service model as having a lot of advantages over an endpoint. But I would not say at this point in time that the endpoint is dead. I think that the endpoint still has some value. It is 
just by its very nature more secure. It's by its very nature has the possibility at least of being more efficient in terms of having less kind of hops on, on the road of the internet. Um, but now that technology is getting better, I do think we're seeing a shift towards SaaS. I think that makes sense. I think we're going to continue seeing that. Um, so I, I, but I think that form has to follow function. If a group already has, you know, Cisco Jabber set up in their network and that's what they're comfortable using, I don't want to layer another piece of technology on top of that. So I am a big believer in simplicity as well. So I, I think you have to take it all in context. You want to build a customized solution, but I think as time goes on, we're going to see more software as a service. And I think that that just makes sense. Sorry, I was muted. Um, okay, so do we have any other questions, other audience questions at this time? Now's the time to use that Q&A function and, uh, and ask while we have the, the master here with us. I don't know about all that, but I'm sucking <laughs> every day. How about that? Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so, um, oh, here's another good question. Does Iris Telehealth have a direct-to-consumer model? So not currently. Um, I, I do think that direct to consumer is ultimately an excellent way to provide the best access, right? If we're talking about true convenience, we are one step removed from direct to consumer in some cases. So really at this point, all of our work goes through a healthcare organization. So we are able to do direct to a consumer through an insurer or direct to consumer through an employer, but we don't really directly advertise or market to the masses. That's not really, you know, I'm not very interested in, in trying to sell to people. I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that healthcare is very traditional uh, in, in many ways. And so I think that the traditional method of healthcare delivery still has a lot of value in terms of um, looking at population management. I mean, I think that I think that there is value to population management and being able to do things in more than just a one-to-one -one type of way. So looking at populations. But I also think that being able to give care to a person's home is um, incredibly convenient. And, and I think we're going to see more of that. Um, so it's a place where, and, and you know, without getting too much into regulations, I mean, we can only do what regulations allow us to do, and, and we're seeing a lot of improvement in, in what is reimbursable and what is allowed in the home. So I'm very confident and we're very excited about getting into that space. I would not say that it is our expertise currently, but certainly over the next 24 to 48 months, I'm hoping that we're doing much more in that space as regulations make it just more permissive to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you said you didn't want to get into regulations, but I have a regulatory question for you, if you don't mind. No, go for um, it. So the biggest thing that we get asked at the, t at the TRC here, um, and, and by the way, telepsychiatry is the most popular tele-whatever specialty that uh, we get asked about. Um, so we get asked about the direct-to-consumer kind of stuff a lot, or patients being able to be seen from their home. Um, and I know that Medicare and Medicaid in almost every state um, do not allow the patient, uh, the originating site to be at the patient's home or outside of a clinical setting. Um, do you have any crystal ball guesses when that might change? The short answer is no. I, you know, I, I never pretend to know more than I know. I, you know, I think that groups are afraid of risk. Um, groups like Medicaid and Medicare, they're afraid of, of risk. And by risk, I mean spending more money without the outcomes being there. They're very tight. I mean, you know, we, everybody's not sure what's going to happen with the administration change and they don't want to go more at risk. I think that what we're seeing is, is people are beginning to show data um, that is very positive. And we kind of know that, right? If you pick the population right and you deliver the care right, not only is care going to improve, but it's going to cost less. And, and you've got to really show both of those things. I think once they feel very confident that they are not going to overexpose themselves, that the data is there, that they know how to do it, they are going to move forward with it. And we're seeing that now, right? They're doing it in pilots. They're doing it in small scales. We're working with many MCOs who are trying to roll this out selectively to get it right before they scale it out. So it's coming and it, you know, it, it needs to. I think that they realize to contain their costs, they need to do it. 
Um, the good news is all the data coming back. I mean, I haven't seen anything that's been blatantly negative. I mean, some things have been inconclusive, but most are generally showing um, positive effects and, and outcome and, and money. And you've got to show both of those, right? I mean, as a clinician, I, it's easy to just focus on, on the outcomes, but, you know, groups like insurers need to show that it's cost effective as well. So, mm -hmm. I do not have a crystal ball. I, I think that I, you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur, so I move faster than government wants to, you know, I want things to move faster than government moves. But it is, I mean, I've been doing this now from a business standpoint for four years, and it's been amazing to see what is possible now that wasn't possible then. And I mean, four years is, is a blink in the eye in, in government legislation time. So I don't have an answer. You know, we're seeing changes state by state every year. Um, so, I mean, I think it's coming, but I don't, I don't have a better guess as, as to when than, than you would, Becky. Sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I am, I'm hopeful with some of the new pilots and stuff, especially with some of the ACO telehealth waivers that have come out recently, that, that it won't be too far in the future, but I would guess three to five years if I had to make a guess. Um, so another question um, dealing with the opioid epidemic. Um, how do you see telemedicine fitting into better access? And there's, you know, a lot more um, attention being paid at the federal level to substance abuse treatment and, and including that in the medical home model. Yeah, that is an excellent question. And so I can answer it on a clinical level and I can also kind of talk about um, regulatory. You know, as soon as you're talking about um, well, I, I should separate it. You can have opioid treatment and you can have um, substance abuse treatment without using controlled substances. But a common and, and very clinically proven method is right suboxone or medication assisted treatment. And that's, that's a really hot topic right now in terms of, you know, is that appropriate to do via telemedicine? And, and I wish that the answer on that were more clear. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's, many conversations being had around that. I, I think that there's many questions kind of being asked in terms of, you know, how liberal do we want rules to be in terms of treatment of these things? I mean, do we really want opioid treatment to be able to occur in the home? Um, I, I, and I don't want to even pretend I have an answer to that. I certainly think that we do need to allow opioid treatment to occur in treatment facilities. And I think medication assisted treatment is absolutely appropriate over telemedicine. If you're, you know, so long as you're doing all of the appropriate clinical steps that you need to do to prescribe and treat um, to the standard of care. The opioid epidemic is, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, they talk about it a lot, just like they talk about mental health or not a lot, but I still don't think the pendulum has really swung far enough in terms of how big a problem people realizing the opioid epidemic is. Um, I, I don't do much clinical work anymore. Um, I, I still do some. It, it impacts me almost every day in clinic. And so, you know, ask any clinician, I mean, ask any family and, and they see it. And I think that where is the opioid epidemic? Sure, it's in cities, it's in LA, et cetera, but it's also tearing up small towns. Southwest Virginia coal country, you know, Pacific Coast, Oregon. I mean, there are huge pockets of people who have no, like literally no access to care. And the only way to get them what would be considered high quality care is going to be through telemedicine. I mean, I, so I think that it has to be a tool in dealing with some of these like just opioid ravaged communities um, to get them appropriate treatment. So I, I think that, yes, I think telemedicine can be one strong tool in helping target the the opioid and just substance abuse problem in in rural america thank you you know i um i just was reading an article about a program in portugal where they were um if somebody had 10 days or less of a illegal drug on them when they were caught whatever picked up by police then they were considered a patient and they were entered into a drug treatment program instead of being sent to jail. That is really interesting. And I've also seen a similar program in Canada where they're synthesizing illegal drugs and making sure that they're clean drugs, not, you know, mixed with something that's going to be worse um, and trying to treat people again with substance abuse issues like patients and coming in and having their shot of whatever it is that's a synthesized drug and weaning them that way. 
Yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. And, and I think that this begins to get political. And so I will we'll try and avoid kind of the political bend of things. But I think that we know that certain programs work from a clinical and statistical standpoint, um, right? Like risk, risk reduction techniques. So as you're saying, clean needle techniques, right? Where, where communities will give clean needles to drug users um, so that they decrease the spread of HIV or Hep B or, or whatever might be a communicative disease. Um, or methadone programs is another really great example of that. And Suboxone would sort of fall in the same vein, but not exactly the same. Methadone is an opioid replacement, right? So as opposed to having a person who's using heroin on the street and you don't know what they're getting and they're up and down and when they don't get their heroin, they're more likely to turn to crime to get the money to get the heroin. If they're willing to commit and come and be treated as a patient and, and you know, take drug tests and have accountability, they can receive methadone. And that will keep their withdrawals under control. It will allow them to be a functional member of society. And it's a risk reduction technique. And, and what you're describing is exactly the same. Now, I think it, it leaves people often feeling uncomfortable because it comes down to, you know, what is accountability and those sorts of things. You know, I won't give you my political bend. I mean, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, so maybe you can guess what it is. I mean, I, I am all for appropriate treatment. I do view, um, substance abuse as being a mental health illness. Um, I, I think that things are complicated, right? I mean, there, there's no black or white in psychiatry. I think that, you know, you need to get comfortable with that. But I think it, it very night, neatly falls within our domain. And I'm all for those types of programs, um, especially when they have data behind them. And, and so I think that, uh, anyways, I won't go into more than that. But yes, I think that that this country could benefit from viewing um, more criminal activities as, as mental health issues. And, and I should say earlier on, especially as, as, as kids or children or, or these sorts of things, I think getting, and I'm a child psychiatrist, so that's sort of what I see more. And I, I see this often dichotomy or split in the road where there's a kid who's 14 who's experimenting with drugs or whatever, and you can go down the criminal route and you know, you're, you're gonna, and this kid's gonna end up in jail very likely when they're an adult, or you get on the mental health treatment route and you give them a shot of being a functional citizen. And you know, one, obviously it's a better life for them, but two, it costs the system a lot less money. So mm -hmm. I, I think that those ideas are great, but I think there's always political kickback and, mm -hmm. and it's about finding the balance and doing it the right way. And I, I think that's a tricky, and I think that's a tricky path to walk. Fortunately, as a clinician, I don't have to make those decisions, um, but I do think that from a clinical standpoint, they make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I have a friend who works at a prison, um, here in Hendricks County where I live, which is one of the donut counties around Indianapolis, Indiana. And he talks about, he's an RN there, and he talks about, you know, what, with a 78% with a recidivism rate, so 78% of the inmates are repeat offenders who have gotten out and then come back in for whatever reason. You know, how do we and this is not a direct question to you. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows the answer, but how do we as a society do a better job of reintegrating inmates into regular life and not falling back into whatever bad pattern got them there in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I, you're right. Of course, there's no answer. I, you know, I think that um, these have, I think big things need to shift, you know, social views on things, the way that, our prison system works. I mean, there have been some small prison systems that have shown a lot of success. Um, you're right, it is very difficult. And I think that oftentimes we have to be realistic with what expectations are gonna be. I mean, it, it, is, it is not easy for long-term personality traits to change um, overnight, especially without a lot of treatment and that we all know, you know, prison environment is often not the most therapeutic. And so, you know, I think in some ways, we have to be realistic with what outcomes are going to be given mm -hmm. what we're doing in these situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll open it up again for questions, but I, and just our conversation. Um, so the other question I wanted to ask you is about workforce development. Um, psychiatrists in particular are at such high demand and there's so many rural areas that have difficulty finding care for their patients. What do you think the workforce the future looks like? Oh, I'm glad you're asking that. Um, I hope I don't get into trouble for saying this. Um, so I think I have 
a couple of big jobs in my role as uh, you know at Iris Telehealth, and one of them is, and I mentioned this before, happy people make for a happy business. We work very, very hard to make sure that our clinicians are happy. Um, and I can tell you that there, I'm a clinician and there's just this undertone that administration in medicine is bad and money in medicine is bad, et cetera. And I've come to realize that that doesn't have to be the case. I think that oftentimes there is a large disconnect between administration and the clinical side of medicine. And whenever that happens, those are the organizations that are feeding grounds for Iris Telehealth. Those clinicians become unhappy because they're not feeling gratified in their clinical duty. And they feel that, you know, the highest honor of providing that patient care is being pushed down below money or whatever the case might be. And they look to move somewhere else. And mental health in particular, um, they can get a job. <laughs> they can get a job anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that we need to recognize that clinicians are just like everyone else. They need to feel respected. They need to feel listened to. They need to feel that they're not a cog. Um, they need to be happy in their job. So I think that the more a group is able to be flexible with, and, and I, I also, I mean, I understand a group has to be financially sustainable, right? And I've said that earlier, or else it doesn't work. There, there needs to be money to medicine, but I think there needs to be communication. And I think that it needs to be two, two ways. I think that the administrators need to understand the clinical side of medicine a bit better. I think the clinicians need to understand um, the, the, the money side of medicine a little bit better. And I think that once that's done, then they can understand how they, they work in the same direction. I think that, you know, they're in mental health, we're not gonna solve this problem of, of the shortage of psychiatrists, right? We're trying, um, but it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better from just a manpower standpoint. Um, there's a large group of psychiatrists that are retiring. There is not a huge uptick in the number of mental health clinicians. I think there's probably a couple of reasons for that. You know, as I become more and more capitalist, I realize that psychiatry, we're, fair, you know, we're fairly paid. I'm not trying to complain about how much we make, but if a clinician is money motivated, they're unlikely to go into psychiatry. There are, there are many, many other professions where you will earn significantly more money. Um, and I think that that's a part of it. I think that there is still, you know, we mentioned there's stigma in mental health um, for a patient. And, you know, I think that it's also improving for psychiatry, but I, I think that there still is some um, stigma of psychiatry, not being a real doctor, or, you know, I think that that's getting better. But I think that some of those things decrease the, the amount of people um, who are going into psychiatry. I think to answer the question, what we need to do is we need to have people practicing at the peak of their skill set. So this is another thing I might catch flack for, but I do, I'm a strong believer in nurse practitioners helping provide service as much as possible. Um, Potentially independently, I think that if they're capable of practicing independently, I'm happy to see them practice independently. Uh, I, and even in independent practice states, we generally will still offer supervision for our clinicians. I think nurse practitioners are a big part of this, uh, physician's assistants. Uh, I think that, you know, technology can play a role in this. You know, I think that there are more people who could benefit from therapy than people that can give therapy. So any type of technology that can, you know, extend a therapist's ability. So computerized CBT to go along with these types of things. Um, anything that is technology is scalable. So I think technology is a big part of that. Um, Thomas Ansel, who was the previous director of the NIMH, um, recently left the NIMH to actually join Google, uh, one, of, one of Google's branches of smartphone delivery and mental health, the mindfulness side of Google, just realizing that, hey, we've got a big problem to solve. And um, you know, there are some technologies that are helping. Telemedicine can help kind of level the playing field for where technology is developed. But there are still some problems that are simply manpower related that technology can potentially help with. So, you know, and then I can put it back to the pharmaceuticals, you know, the better our treatments are, the better that this is going to get, you know, we don't have many cures. I don't know how simple a cure is going to be, but the better our medicine can be, the, the less of a clinical burden there will be. I think we need to look at this as a multi-pronged approach. And I think the hardest piece to do 
is to very quickly scale up the workforce, right? We can't double the number of psychiatrists overnight. That's it's just not viable to do that. So I think we need to train the primary care doctors better, right? And, and so practicing at the peak of our, our abilities, psychiatrists can do a lot more outreach, a lot more consulting work, a lot more dealing with more difficult cases. So I, I think that it needs to be just a, a, a systems approach. And I, I don't think that it's an easy problem to, to, to work with. Thank you very much. And that's a complicated issue. Um, so one final question um, before we close today, um, talking about academic medical centers. And most of them do want to start some type of telemedicine program, but they might find a hard have a hard time finding a clinical champion. So how would you recommend incentivizing physicians to be part of uh, some type of a pilot in this arena? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't know if they will have a hard time finding a clinical champion. Um, I don't think that it's something that will always be readily available, but I, I think that there are people who recognize the clinical value of what telemedicine can do. And so long as they're comfortable with the technology, oftentimes they're able to really push their organization to champion the service. Sometimes what we see is it's a transplant from somewhere else, right? And it's getting back to this whole magic thing where it has to, you know, it has to have been in your hands. I mean, what we'll often see is somebody moves from Dignity Health to, you know, some other group. And, you know, they had a lot of experience at Dignity Health doing it and they become the champion in the new group. So a transplant who brings that sort of experience with them, like, how are you guys managing this? without telemedicine, they're like, well, we don't have telemedicine. And it, it just kind of blows their mind. Like, I'm not going to sleep until you guys have telemedicine. You know, I think that the more outreach there is, I think the more that people um, have personal experience with it. I think that as telemedicine gets more mainstream, we find that to be easier and easier. You know, we're answering, we're rarely answering the question, what is telepsychiatry anymore, right? We're, we're rarely, you know, having to describe what this is to clinicians or to groups. We're really just trying to help them navigate it. So I, I think that people are getting more comfortable with it. There, there are people who are more familiar with it. Um, I don't know if I, I have, that, I, that's not really a good answer to your question, Becky. I don't know how to nurture a champion. Um, maybe I would think it's more about finding them, you know, really saying, hey, guys, this is something we want to do. Who would want to take this on? Who would be excited about doing it? I don't think that financial incentives are the way to go. Um, I, I think that it needs to be somebody who has a passion. And I've learned that money can't buy passion, really. Um, money, I mean, you need to pay people money, of course. But, but passion has to be something that comes from, from within. So I think that you've just got to find the passion in your organization and then you know, allow them to do it, kind of get out of their way, so to speak, would probably be the best advice that I could give. Thank you. On that note, then, um, Amna, do you have any closing information for us? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shaheen, for sharing the key, key ingredients that you have gathered over the years to build a successful telepsychiatry program. And just uh, for everybody who's attending, this webinar would be available to view on our YouTube channel at the UMTRC YouTube channel. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, for our upcoming webinars on the events page at the umtrc.org page. And I think that's all. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much.